I like this picture because obviously uh, we're the only blue dot in the solar system. So I'm going, how many are students in here? Okay, good. I have a question, two questions to, for you to think about before I begin. Why are the oceans blue, first of all? You're looking at the oceans from space, okay? So they're blue. So why are the oceans blue? That's the question number one. And question number two, where did the water come from? Okay, I'm gonna advertise my book, which just came out a couple of weeks ago. So uh, if you, I'm not gonna tell you why the oceans are blue in this book, but I'm gonna tell you that the reason that I wrote the book is I teach a course called The History of the Earth Systems, um, and I'm in a geology department. I'm a biologist in a geology department. And I got very tired of explaining to geologists that microbes matter. So I wrote a book for the popular press. It's a, called a trade book, which means if you buy it, you can trade it for something of equal or better value. Now, let's begin at the beginning. We've started to measure temperature on this planet with thermometers in the 17th century. The original thermometer is in the Royal Society. And from around 1760 to now, we have temperatures on various places of the Earth's surface. Obviously, now we have many, many, many weather stations that have recorded temperatures for a long period of time. We started to measure carbon dioxide in the atmosphere around 1956, when Dave Keeling uh, started to do this in Mauna Loa. And uh, for the first 10 or 15 years, we saw seasonal patterns in CO2, which I'm not showing on this slide, but the point is that for 10 or 15 years, people thought this had to do something with the seasonal migration of tourists to Hawaii and airplane emissions of carbon dioxide. It was crazy. But over time, there was a secular trend in CO2, which Dave very, very, very carefully followed. Dave was, and his son still is, obsessed with atmospheric gases. And the guy was an incredibly uh, careful analytical chemist. And these data were finally taken over in the late, mid-1980s till now by NOAA. And so we have many, many stations around the world that record these observations of CO2. And CO2 this year reached a value of 400 ppm CO2. Now, I'm going back in 1873 on page 15 of the first edition of the first volume of the Challenger Expedition, which is upstairs. There's a mechanism for showing how carbonic acid is extracted from seawater. On page 17, of the same volume, of the first volume, there's an illustration showing how gases from the air were extracted from seawater. So we could measure nitrogen, oxygen from the air in seawater in 1873. And they were not invented for the Challenger Expedition. We actually had these earlier. So we have gas measurements that are actually from the atmosphere, but these were not calibrated very well. And so we've measured these gases back here and through many, many, many thousands of years, going back at least nine glacial interglacial cycles based on ice cores. And there's been a lot, a lot, a lot of attention paid to this. So let me just give you the short and gritty. During the last glacial, over an 80,000 year period, Carbon dioxide went to a low of 190 ppm CO2. It took 80,000 years. And then over the next 20,000 years, it rose to 280 ppm CO2. And that cycle repeated itself on 100,000 year intervals for the last eight or so glacial interglacial cycles for which we have data. So it was 190 at the minimum, 280 at the top, and nobody knows why it was 280 at the top. Nobody knows what set the 280. But let's just think about this for a minute. This is the atmosphere. We're looking at only gases in the atmosphere. So when it went from 280 during interglacial times, when it was warm, down to 190, where did the CO2 go? The CO2 went from the terrestrial ecosystems into the ocean. At some point, there's a interglacial cycle which releases CO2 from the ocean back to the atmosphere, back to terrestrial ecosystems, melts ice, and it sets at 280. 
And that's the natural cycle. So let's put it simply this way. When Hannibal crossed the Alps, when Washington crossed the Delaware River, when the Royal Society was set, when the Institute Francois France of France was set, when Lavoisier measured gases in the atmosphere, it was 280 ppm CO2. From around 1850 till now, it has risen virtually exponentially. There is no question that this is because, nobody disagrees that this is because primarily 90% of this increase is due simply to combustion of fossil fuels. Another 10% approximately is due to the production of cement. Some of this was due to deforestation. That's not a negative now. We don't really have this problem. So I'm just pointing out to you that that's the first role of the ocean was as a valve between the atmosphere, which was only a long corridor between two large rooms, the terrestrial biosphere and the ocean itself. Now, the uptake of the CO2 by the ocean has virtually nothing to do with biology. Virtually nothing to do with biology. This is a physical chemical process. Virtually nothing. Now, over the same period of last 40 years or so, 50 years, we've been able to measure, this is very, very controversial, we've, we have been able to measure temperature back over 100 years in the ocean with various types of thermometers, but really in the deep ocean it's been very, very difficult to measure temperature very, very, very accurately. You need this to many decimal, several decimal points. And when we start to get up into the modern world, we can do this now quite, quite well. So a lot of this was reconstructed over time, and these are our best guesses. So this is now heat content, and it's in joules, 10 to the 22 joules. We don't use heat content for the atmosphere, we use temperature, which is a little confusing, and that's because it's not an equivalency. If the temperature of the ocean changes by one degree, the temperature of the atmosphere changes by one degree, there's much more change in heat to make the ocean warm by one degree than it is to make the the atmosphere warm by one degree, okay? So let's just put it simply that this heat storage represents about 93% or so of the heat that has been generated by that increase in carbon dioxide, which is a greenhouse gas. There are other greenhouse gases which I'm not showing, like methane, nitrous oxide, and so on, but carbon dioxide is the one that changes most, in which we have better atmosphere. Now, I'm going to talk about this from a point of view of a bio, biophysicist in the ocean who's looked at this for some time. And let me just bore you for a second with some nitty-gritty details. I showed you that the ocean is blue. And <clears throat> chlorophyll, obviously, is green. So if you go outside and you look at any plant out there, it's green. So why is a plant green? Because it's absorbing blue and red light. And what it doesn't absorb, you see. So it's green. So this is the distribution of chlorophyll as a log function versus the ratio of green to blue. And this is the actual distribution function with the error bars, or the variance bars, really, which is the basis of observing systems from space. So we have satellites since around 1978 that can observe the ocean color from space. What are we observing? We're looking at how much of the blue photons have been absorbed by phytoplankton, the little mini plants, the single-celled organism in the ocean that contain chlorophyll, and we can reconstruct maps of chlorophyll from satellites. So when we start, first start talking now about distributions of chlorophyll concentrations, we're talking about distributions of photosynthetic biomass. Now, this algorithm works for the ocean. It, it, we use, actually, a very different algorithm for terrestrial plants. It's not using this algorithm at all. It's a very different one. But for the ocean, it works very, very well, this simple green-blue ratio. So you map the green, you map the blue bands, you make a ratio of the two, and basically, you can get a distribution of the chlorophyll. Now, the second thing we do, and I did this when I was working in France, down with, France, uh, with André Morel, <coughs> in Villefranche-sur-Mer. André was one of the very, very finest optical oceanographers in the world. Unfortunately, he died a few years ago. Um, 
And by the by, Andre was a diver with Cousteau, so he was one of these real, true Renaissance men. He was a he was a fabulous painter of, uh, of impressionist paintings of his own. He was a concert pianist uh, and as well uh, just an historian of science, just an amazing person, wonderful person. So, okay, so we're measured for many, many thousands of times photosynthesis by carbon-14 uptake in the oceans. This was first started by Iman Steele Nielsen in 1952, radiocarbon. And so we had thousands and thousands and thousands of measurements of carbon-14, uh, which is the productivity as a function of depth, physical depth. And if you normalize this to so-called optical depth, so this is the 1% light depth of the ocean, 4.6 uh, optical depths, that's an e-folding of light, it's a hair straightener. We just took curled, really fuzzy hair, and these all line up with the same basic profile. And then you can collapse that profile. The variance here is primarily a function of temperature. And you can make measurements now that take the chlorophyll concentration, a model, and you need now time. Time comes from light. Light has units of quanta per meter squared per unit time. And we get a rate. So when we get a rate, we can measure the productivity of the planet for the oceans, and independently with another set of algorithms for the terrestrial biosphere. Now, in 1998, Chris Field and I, who is a terrestrial ecologist, at, and he actually was the scientific leader of the IPCC number five report, Chris and I worked together with our two postdocs, Mike Berenfeld and, and Jim Randerson, and we synthesized all the data that we had for the productivity of the planet. And it hasn't changed very much. The terrestrial biosphere has a huge amount of biomass. Most of it is in wood. It's not very active photosynthetically, but there it is. It's 600 petagrams, or 600 gigatons. There's less than 1% of that in the ocean, when you're flying over the ocean, you don't exactly see forests. So <clears throat> the phytoplankton biomass is very, very low. But the calculations suggest that about 45% of the biomass is turning over about once every four or five days. And as such, then, it's responsible for about 45% of the carbon fixation on the planet. So it's the little engine that could. The terrestrial biosphere is responsible for 55 or so percent. That ratio is a little fuzzy, but it's about right. Now, has it changed? In 1997, we had a huge eruption of Pinatubo. And so we had large changes in euphotic zone concentration of chlorophyll in parts of the tropics. But once we started to clear out the atmosphere, and much of this is probably occluded by atmospheric debris from the, from the eruption, but once we started to clear out the atmosphere, we could look at sea surface temperature changes and chlorophyll concentrations, and the chlorophyll concentrations mapped sea surface temperature anomalies. What does that mean? As the ocean warmed, the chlorophyll concentration got lower. So let me go back for a second. When you see this, chlorophyll is very low here and is getting high when it gets darker green. You see that? Here, it's getting darker green. You see that? That's when nutrients are brought to the surface. And the, the shoaling now of the mixed layer allows the bloom to occur. These are not blooms of pico eukaryotes. These are blooms of large eukaryotic diatoms or coccolithophores and later on. That's what blooms. We never see blooms of prochlorococcus or synecococcus, the cyanobacteria, the little tiny guys. All right, now, next thing. Many years ago, in the early 1980s, I started to work on fluorescence. And, and I knew fluorescence would be a good technique because you could measure photons very, 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 very precisely. So chlorophyll itself fluoresces. And it, when it's in a living cell, 
If fluorescence changes as you populate the reaction centers with photons, as you reduce, this is photochemistry. So this is photosynthesis by looking at, this is the time of 100 microseconds. And we could show what this actually means. I'm not going to go into the biophysics of this. This is very complicated. But the point is that we could make devices that we could put into the ocean and put them on ships and go long, long, long distances. In this case, we're going from Portsmouth down to the Falkland Islands. And what you see over here is the variations in photosynthesis along the track. The cells are responding to pulses of nutrients that are coming to them. When there's very little nutrient, there's very little photosynthesis. When there's a lot of nutrient, they adapt very, very quickly, within hours. This is not like a terrestrial plant. These organisms are extremely they're, they're, they're body surfing. They're waiting for that wave to come with nutrients. Then they go out and they catch the wave and they ride it for a couple of days. And then the nutrient goes away and they wait. Okay? That's what they do. That's not what a corn plant does. Now, when you start to look at nutrient distributions in the ocean, and I didn't do this, Joe Reed did this many years ago at Scripps Institute of Oceanography, but it was picked up on by John Martin. And let me explain to you what he dis discovered. There are three major areas of the world ocean that contain high amounts of nutrients in the surface, even when the sun is shining. These are called high nutrient low chlorophyll regions. The eastern tropical Pacific, the subarctic Pacific, and the entire southern ocean. And this nutrient concentration is even high in the boreal, in the austral summer when the sun is shining virtually 24 hours a day. And it's not because of temperature. You see, that's very warm, that's quite cold, that's cool. Now, Martin did something quite clever. He realized <laughs> that ships are very dirty with containing metals, and if he went out with metal-free bottles, he could measure much, much more accurately the concentration of very, very small amounts of trace metals in the surface ocean. And this is an example going down to the depth of 5,000 meters of distributions of iron, manganese, copper, and molybdenum. But let's just take a look at iron, which is right there. Now, iron is in nanomolar. That's 10 to the minus 9th molar. That's 1 nanomolar. That's about 100 picomolar. 100 times 10 to the minus 12th molar is what it is in the surface of the Pacific Ocean. Wow. When that paper was published, some of my colleagues turned to me. And I remember very distinctly, I was at a meeting in Annapolis in Maryland. I think it was 1988. And one of my colleagues turned to me. She said, that's bullshit. That can't be. That can't be. John convinced, and you have to understand, this was an amazing person. John was not paralyzed, but he was in a wheelchair most of the last 20 years of his adult life. He would go to sea in a wheelchair. He was in pain all of his, all the day. He was a very stubborn guy. He convinced the National Science Foundation after three years to allow him to do an iron fertilization experiment. And let's just see what he thought about it. John didn't quite know this, but he had a suspicion. And it's based upon, actually, an observation by Darwin, believe it or not, in the Voyage of the Beagle. When Darwin was over the, uh, I guess it was the Azores and the Canary Islands, this is Africa, he realized that the sky was yellow. Now, I worked with Andre Morel over the Canary Islands in the summer on the Atalante, which is not a bad ship. If you have to go to sea, go to sea on the Atalante. Not bad. Um, <clears throat> much, much nicer than American ships. The sky was yellow because it's blowing dust from the Sahel, not the Sahara, 
necessarily, but the sahil, which is the lowest dust. This is glacial dust or very, very small deposits. In this case, not glacial, but very small deposits, very fine-grained material that blows and wafts out over the North Atlantic Ocean. And this is a distribution of dust in the atmosphere. Now, Aeolian means, in Greek, the wind, right? The god of wind. So a major source of iron to the ocean in the modern ocean is the continent. It's continental dust. And the distribution function of the dust is seasonal. It's much, much higher in the summer in the northern hemisphere. And because there are very few continents, or very le much less continent in the southern hemisphere, there's much less dust. Now you already see why the Antarctic has a problem. It doesn't have a big supply of dust. Australia has dust, but it's blowing up into the Indian Ocean. It's not blowing down into the Southern Ocean. Now, let's see if I can get this to go. So this is an iron fertilization experiment. This is not the one that Martin was on. Martin actually never went to sea on the first iron fertilization experiment. Um, <clears throat> he died shortly after the experiment was done, which was in the eastern tropical Pacific. We were on that boat. But this is another cruise. This is actually one to the southern ocean. And this is the Melville, a script ship. It actually took two ships down to the southern ocean on this particular voyage. Uh, this is just a, a view of the crew meeting for a second in the conference room, the, the, and the, the, the team, actually. And here you're watching now how we're going to put iron into the ocean. So these are the cans that contain iron. <clears throat> it's a, not a laboratory experiment. They're being lifted over to a mixing vessel. This is ferrous sulfate. There's Mr. Mixer. He's not wearing a tie. OK. He puts it in. He adds a little bit of a tracer and some acid to dissolve it, very little. And now this is the big iron fertilization valve. This is a hose with a lead weight on it. It goes off the fantail. He turns on, flips the switch, and now we're fertilizing the ocean. This is the Southern Ocean. Now, I'll just show you for a second. How many of you have never been to sea? Just a couple of you. All right. Well, maybe we don't have to go through this. This is just Niskin bottles on a rosette. And this is the standard rosette system. And I'll stop this in a second if I'm going to bore you. Here we go. Blah, blah, blah. There's Dick Barber. For those of you who know Dick Barber, he's a very famous biological oceanographer who is now retired from Duke University. And then the second, I want to show you what the John Martin bottles look like. So these will go down to various depths. There's Ken calling out the depths at which he wants to fire the bottles. And now these bottles are acid washed. They have no metal parts in them. They're being lowered on a Kevlar line with an internal acoustic release system. There's no metal anywhere near them, and these will be used for trace metal-free analyses. And this is what biological oceanographers do, is they filter water. So there's some very interesting, this is my former student, Sasha Tatsi. Um, and I'm going to go on to this. Now let's just think about this for a second. So, it's like mowing a lawn. We go up and down and up and down. So it's like six or eight meter, eight, eight kilometers by eight kilometers. And you know when you started, this is when you put out the iron. And you know when you ended. And then the ship is cutting across here, like this. Now this particular one I'm going to show you is from the eastern equatorial Pacific, because it's a little faster. So we're cutting across. You know exactly in time when that iron was laid out, exactly. 
And this is the change in the photochemical efficiency of the ocean as we added the iron. In 24 hours, it doubled. There's no change in the chlorophyll concentration. You can't see anything with your naked eye. But the photosynthetic efficiencies of these bugs increased immediately, within 24 hours. What does that mean? They're fixing carbon, they're em emitting oxygen. Now, I'm not going to go into the whole deal here. We did this. This is the change in the quantum efficiency of the ocean that we got under cover of nature. That was in 1996. I'm going to finish this little part up with this, if you'll bear with me for a second. <clears throat> the chlorophyll distributions in the ocean can be measured by just by fluorescence, and we can do this from space. Now, as far as I know, This is the only signal that we can see from space that proves there's life on Earth. The only one. And what does it mean? It means that the distribution function of light as it leaves the ocean, if you're an observer looking down at the light, uh, down at the ocean, the light is backscattered to you with a power function of e to the minus lambda to the, mi the wavelength to the minus 4.3 power. And it's because of, now that's why the ocean is blue, it's because of fluctuation density scattering, not because of Rayleigh scattering like the sky. But at some point, you see this little, little, little emission of red photons coming out of the very surface of the ocean that shouldn't be there. And that's the chlorophyll fluorescing that you can see with a very, very, very fine imaging system from space. And it looks like this. It's called the fluorescence line height. And we can make movies of this. And what does it mean? Well, a few years ago, 19, in 2008, we made an instrument in my lab with Max Gorbanov that measures the quantum yield of fluorescence in the ocean by another system called lifetimes. And I don't want to bore you with all the details of the lifetimes, but the point is this. We have many, many, many tens of thousands of measurements across the world ocean of fluorescence lifetimes that are simultaneous with what the satellite sees from space as fluorescence line height. And this paper is cooking in nature now for, I mean, science now for six weeks or more. I don't know why, but it's taking a long time to decide to reject it. But in any way, the average minimum photosynthetic energy efficiency is 32%. That means 32% of the photons, on average, that are coming from the sun, that are absorbed by the cell, are converted to something that fixes carbon dioxide to make an organic material. The fluorescence Lifetime, on average, is 1.1 nanoseconds. Now, the, the ratio of that lifetime to this lifetime gives you 7% of the photons that are coming in from the sun that are absorbed by the phytoplankton are going into fluorescence. That means that, on average, 60% of the solar energy that goes into the ocean that is absorbed by the cell is emitted as heat. This is ridiculous. You made a Maserati, and it's running on two cylinders. Terrestrial plants are totally different. About 60% would be going into photosynthesis, about 3% would be going into heat, and only about 30 some odd percent would be going, I mean, uh, fluorescence, and about only 30% would be going into heat. So when we talk about climate change, we're not talking in, a, in theory here. We're talking in reality. We're talking about moving this efficiency even lower if we're reducing the amount of nutrients that are coming to the surface and making that even higher. Not a good thing. Now, I talked yesterday about tipping points. Tipping points are mathematically described quite rigorously, but they're a point at which you go from one steady state to another. And there are many, many types of tipping points, and I'm not going to go into them all, but have they ever happened? Now, let's talk about this in terms of oxygen, since we're very interested in that particular molecule. I just want to point out to you that in the steady state, and we're in the steady state for the most part as a globe, 
This is the way we get oxygen. Water plus carbon dioxide is producing a sugar plus this waste product. That's what a photosynthetic organism does. So first to note, and it took many years to prove this, that the oxygen in the planet comes from water. Now, for those students that are still in the audience, still with me and still interested, we have 10 to the 19th moles of oxygen in the atmosphere. It comprises, it's not a trace gas, it's 21% of the volume of the atmosphere. It all came from the ocean, all of it. 100% of it came from water in the ocean at one point. If we were to turn this off and make this reaction go all the way back to water and CO2, and you're going to say, how do we do that? I'll show you in a second. If that were to happen, how high would the sea level rise? Okay, how high would the sea level rise? If I took all the oxygen and put it back into the ocean as water, how high would the sea level rise? All right, let's just finish this off. How do we do this? Well, you're doing this right now. You're taking a sugar that you had for lunch or breakfast or dinner last night, and you're combining it with this molecule in the atmosphere, and you're producing two gases. You know about this gas, but this is another gas. You're produ two minutes? Okay. You're producing this gas. So these reactions are balanced on a planetary scale, on geological time, but the reason that we have this gas in the atmosphere is we hid this from respiration from microbes. We stored that. Where did we store it? We stored it in rocks. When we're talking about oxygen, we're talking about carbon being buried, not temporarily for a long, long time, hundreds and hundreds of millions of years. And I'm not going to go into how that works, but let's just talk about one other thing. Oxygen drives many cycles on the planet, not just aerobic respiration. So this is oxygen concentration in the Black Sea, and there's the nitrate concentration. Below the oxygen minimum, or oxygen zero, there's hydrogen sulfide. There's no nitrate. There's only ammonium. But you watch this. You put it on its side. There's the ocean over geological time, before the land before oxygen, and then the world now. We go through a denitrification event. How that happened, to, how we got through that, I don't know. I don't know how we got oxygen on the planet, frankly. Nobody really knows. But it has an isotopic signal. As we denitrify, we get more and more nitrogen-15 incorporated into organic matter. And over geological time, let me just do this, we can see that there were major, major events where the nitrogen-15 in organic matter got very high. That's when you had no oxygen in the ocean. This happened in the Tauartian. It happened in the Plainsbeckian. It happened, 55, it happened 93 million years ago. It happened 120 million years ago. That was a tipping point. We went for long periods of time when there was no oxygen or virtually no oxygen in the deep ocean. The organisms that were in the deep ocean were repopulated from shallow seas. There was oxygen in shallow seas, but not in the deep ocean. So I'm going to stop there. I just pointed out to you that the productivity of the planet is not a constant, it's not a given. It depends very much on the physics. And the oxygen content of the deep ocean is because of penetration of oxygen from the surface. It's not because of phytoplankton producing oxygen. It's because of the oxygen is coming from the atmosphere and injected into the deep ocean by thermohaline circulation. And that can be shut off, and it has been shut off historically. It was a tipping point. I hope we never go there. Thank you very much. Paul, what would be the, the next uh, question that you would like to solve? What life does is it moves electrons around. So when we're talking about making oxygen, we're talking about taking electrons off of water and putting them ultimately onto carbon to make organic matter. Respiratory reactions do the opposite. There are five major elements that, move that are critical for electron movement on, on the Earth. There's hydrogen, oxygen, carbon, nitrogen, and sulfur. 
And what I'm spending the next several years doing in my lifetime, at academic life, is not focusing on these global scales right now anymore, for the most part. I'm focusing on how those little transistors in life actually move electrons, because on the macro scale, you see them globally. But phenomenally, we don't understand how they work on the micro scale. So I'm just trying to understand what's under the hood, if you will. How does it work? Um, <clears throat> so it's, a, it's not reductionism, but it's, it's a classic example of how do you find a pattern across a, a large swath of, a, of reactions that are really dominating life, metabolism. We were talking about life, water and gases. We are now facing one big problem at a planetary scale. We are discussing solutions, including geoengineering, and you were talking here about ocean fertilization. Uh, high nutrients, low chlorophyll, a lot of space in the water in the ocean to do experiments. Uh, you know the IOC position about that, so I'm not going to try to influence you in the response, but which is your opinion about ocean fertilization? Well, there's a very famous quote from John Martin, um, and it was, if you give me a tanker full of iron, I'll give you an ice age. Um, there's no doubt in my mind, I think, and the data are, are continuously supporting this, that part of the drawdown of carbon dioxide during the glacial, interglacial times is due to a biological fertilization of the ocean by iron. The extent to which you would want to do this now uh, is very controversial for the following reason. If you add iron to the Southern Ocean, and the only ocean really which this will be effective is the Southern Ocean, and uh, let's forget about the sentimentalization of nature, will you change the ecosystems, I don't, that we're changing the ecosystems, so forget about the sentimentalization of nature. If you increase the flux of organic matter from the surface into the ocean interior, which is what this has to do in order to drive down CO2, this material will not sink to the sediments. This material will almost, most, the vast, vast majority of it will be metabolized in the internal portion of the ocean. And here is the rub. If there is sufficient amount of carbon to be taken down into the interior of the ocean to cause the interior of the ocean to become hypoxic or even anoxic, then you produce nitrous oxide and methane two really potent greenhouse gases. So you may have taken one of the major greenhouse gases in terms of volume out, but you can pr be producing two other or maybe even more greenhouse gases that molecule for molecule are far more potent than CO2, but will be injected back into the atmosphere 50, 100, 200, 1,000 years from now. And so many of my colleagues are extraordinarily concerned about this effect. And um, it, is, it has been almost a deal breaker. There's no way you can take the carbon dioxide out by terrestrial plants. Just, just you don't, you can't. Uh, you can plant all the trees you want on the planet and it's gonna have a trivial impact on the amount of carbon dioxide. The only solution is to sequester it and store it either chemically or put it into the oceans as an inert molecule such as bicarbonate. If we could do that, we'd solve the problem, but this is a very, very hard thing to do. So let me just put it into you in a very, very simple way. In one year, we extract from the lithosphere fossil fuels that took at least one million years to deposit. So we're a million times more efficient than nature one million times more efficient at taking it out than what was put there, right? And now we want nature to be a million times faster than it operates to produce the organic matter to start with. It's a non-starter, okay? 